Exposition by Charles Hedden Spurgeon John 13, 1-17 Verse 1 Now before the feast of the Passover Or, just as it was about to begin 1 when Jesus knew that his hour was come that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. That is a very beautiful description of Christ's death, his hour was that he should depart out of this world unto the Father, just as though he was merely going on a journey, leaving one land for another. And if this is a fair description of such a stormy passage as that of our Lord Jesus, who died for our sins upon Calvary's cross, it must with equal truth describe the death of any of the children of God. There is also an appointed time for us to depart and to be with Christ which is far better than remaining here. The loosing of the cable, the spreading of the sail, the crossing over the narrow sea the coming to the eternal haven and the abiding there, what Christian heart needs to dread this? How much better is it even to look forward to it with ardent anticipation? Think much of the abiding love of Christ, having loved his own, his by election, his by redemption, for he regarded that as already done which was about to be accomplished, having loved his own which were in the world, not yet in heaven but still in the midst of trial, still imperfect, even as you and I are, he loved them unto the end, or, unto the perfection, as it might be rendered. The alpha of his love which we find in eternity bids us believe that we shall find the omega of it nowhere but there. 2-4. And supper being ended, the devil having now put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God, and went to God, he arose from supper, and laid aside his garments, and took a towel, and girded himself notice the wonderful contrast revealed to us in these verses. Our Lord Jesus Christ had a very vivid realization that he had come from God and was going back to God, and that all things had been given into his hand. Yet, while he knew that and had a more than ordinary consciousness of his own dignified nature and position, he condescended to wash his disciples' feet. Though many years elapsed between the event and the time when John recorded it, all the details seem to have been still present in his memory so that he distinctly mentions each separate act. He rose from supper, and laid aside his upper garment and took a towel, and girded himself. 5. After that he poured water into a basin. The one that ordinarily stood in the guest chamber for the washing of the hands and feet of the guests. 5, 6. And began to wash the disciples' feet, and to wipe them with the towel wherewith he was girded. Then came he to Simon Peter, and Peter said unto him, Lord, do you wash my feet? You must lay the stress on the pronouns in order to get the full forge of the original. Lord, do you wash my feet? The contrast is between Peter's master and himself. 7, 8. Jesus answered and said unto him, What I do you know not now, but you shall know hereafter. Peter said unto him, You shall never wash my feet, that is, never. As long as I live, you shall do such a thing as that. 8 to 10. Jesus answered him, If I wash you not, you have no part with me. Simon Peter said unto him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, He that is washed needs not, save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit, and you are clean but not all we have often, in commenting, noticed Peter's fault. Perhaps we have noticed that too much. 
Let us now notice Peter's excellence. I admire his humility in thinking it too mean an office for Christ to wash his feet. It seems to me to be a most proper feeling which prompted him to ask, Do you wash my feet? It seemed an overwhelming condescension of love which he could scarcely permit. No doubt he spoke too positively when he said to Christ, You shall never wash my feet, but still, his motive in speaking thus was a good one. It was because he could not allow his Lord to stoop so low, he thought it ill manners to permit such an one as Christ to wash the feet of such an one as the poor fisherman, Peter. I have already said that there was something that was not right and yet that was perfectly natural to this rock disciple, and this dove disciple, who was such a strange mixture of boastfulness and fickleness. Yet do not forget how much of good there was in him. I wish all of us were half as good as Peter. That was a grand utterance, wash not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. He meant, Lord, let me have all the cleansing I can, not only such as the washing of my feet would bring, but such as the washing of my head and my hands also would bring. Let me be clear of everything which would prevent full fellowship with you, for I long to be altogether one with you. Then our Saviour meekly, gently, quietly, explained that there was no need for the washing of his head and his hands, for his whole being had already been renewed by the one great act of regeneration. And as he had been cleansed from sin by the free gift of pardon at the time when he first believed, there was no need of any repetition of the spiritual bathing. All that was required was the washing of his feet, a beautiful distinction always to be observed. He that believes in Christ is fully forgiven. He is like a man who has gone into the bath and washed, but, when he steps out of the bath and puts his foot on the ground, he often soils it, so that before he robes himself, he needs to wash his feet again. That is our condition as believers in Jesus, we are washed in his precious blood and are whiter than snow, but these feet of ours constantly touch this defiling earth so they need, every day, to be washed. Christ our Lord Jesus said to Peter, He that is bathed needs not, save to wash his feet, but is clean every whit, and you are clean, but not all. 11. For he knew who should betray him, therefore said he, You are not all clean. They were all washed so far as their feet were concerned but not all of them had been cleansed in the sacred bath which removes the stains of sin. 12-17 So after he had washed their feet, and had taken his garments, and was set down again, he said unto them, Know you what I have done to you? You call me Master and Lord, and you say well, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and Master, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet for I have given you an example, that you should do as I have done to you. Verity, verily, I say unto you, the servant is not greater than his Lord, neither he that is sent greater than he that sent him. If you know these things, happy are you if you do them. Blessed are they who, when they understand the meaning of Christ's example, imitate it in their own lives.